All right, a warm welcome to everybody. This is the 99th monthly meeting of the Strong Sustainable Business Model Group. Once again, we're 100% uh, virtual. Uh, everybody is mute, so we don't hear background conversation. But for today's topic, uh, C.V. Harkwell is going to share why advocates of flourishing business should think about feminism. But before we get started, please join me in a moment of land acknowledgement. In Canada, it's customary for us to start events with an acknowledgement that compared to indigenous populations, we are all newcomers here, whether our families have lived here for months or for a century. This is part of our truth and reconciliation process with our First Nations, the Indigenous people of Canada. This is sacred land on which each of us are privileged to be. This land, nearby lakes and sea, has supported human beings for thousands of years and is rich in the tradition, history, and knowledge of our Indigenous peoples. We are privileged to be the beneficiaries and the stewards of all that has come before on behalf of the seven generations to come and beyond. We invite you to consider your relationship to the land and how you benefit from being there while the original caretakers may not, and yet many of the real, real uh, caretakers still are. Take a moment to reflect and research, understand, honor, and respect peoples indigenous to the lands where you live, work, and play. I'm personally in Canada, the traditional territories of the Nittitapi and the people of Treaty 7 region, including Siksika, the Kainai, the Blood Tribe Kainai, the Tsutsina, and the Stony Nakoda First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. And if you know your watershed, I'd happy to see it in the, in the chat. And maybe if you know your traditional lands and territories, that would also be interesting for people to know. Um, my watershed is the Bow River Basin. We make this recognition because biophysical environments vary in scale from microscopic to global in context. We can't help but be connected and interconnected to our place. We are dependent on factors in nature that have an influence on survival, development, and evolution. And as such, we depend on, for example, water at a cellular level. We depend on it for our livelihoods, healthy ecosystems, healthy people, and a robust economy. For those of you who are exploring business, better business model, including our tools, the Flourishing Business Model Canvas, this enables you to explore how an enterprise interrelates and is interdependent with social and bi biophysical contexts. So who are we? We're a community of innovation, practice, and research, and our focus is on the design of enterprises that are what we call fit for future. We consider enterprises fit for future if they follow and accomplish a normative purpose, which we call flourishing. There are a lot of possibilities for you to activate within the network, no matter if your focus is education, research, employment, or something else. This is a network that you can enter quite quickly. It's fun. And there's many people here that are open for collaboration and cooperation. And there's a lot of knowledge and competencies and skills in this group. So hopefully you're in the right place and ready to engage in a global network of possibilities. We are a tribe of um, more than this, uh, 280 some, 2,280 2, some. We have grown uh, 47 since the last um, month. So um, hopefully as you are inviting people to join or people are joining, we'll get to know each other a little bit better. But this is a pretty fair representation of where we're located globally. Um, here's the places that we're located on social media. We have a wiki where all the history and um, meeting information and research is kept. Our past present, uh, presentations and recordings are kept on the Google Drive. We have a LinkedIn group called the Strong Sustainable Business Model Group. And you can find us on Facebook uh, and Twitter as well. And we're hoping that you will join our YouTube channel. I'm also posting our videos there for ease of use, for e make it easier for people to find. We'd like to think that we're contributing to a growing and worldwide movement for flourishing enterprises. Our goal is to create impact at scale quickly, to create a world where enterprises excel because humans flourish and nature thrives. The work is based on transdisciplinary science systems, indigenous knowledge and ethical and moral frameworks. We consider ourselves to not only be in sync with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, but even going beyond them. Some of the logos you see here, um, we consider them to be part of our movement. You might recognize them and you might not recognize them. We invite you to look them up. They're all unique and interesting and valuable, valuable contributing organizations to the movement, whether or not they're part of uh, our group or not. These are some of the initiatives that the members of our group have formed. And you can see 
um, some uh, CVs related to a couple of these in order to do good to do well. So this means that members here, so if you have a initiative that you would like to um, put forward to help drive impact for um, business model innovation and social flourishing enterprises, then feel free to put it forward and may maybe you can um, motivate other members of the group to join your quest. Last but not least, uh, we're also a hub for um, scientific public publications, conferences. Um, I'm not sure if all the dates are on here correctly. I believe they are. Uh, if you know of some other conferences or events that are uh, coming up that we might not be aware of, just please put them in the chat and we'll add them to our slide for the next, uh, for the next month. Here are our community animators. If you are, uh, have been attending meetings before, you will have known that on this slide used to be just me and Tim, but now we have uh, Amy Morrell, Carrie Emblem, um, Amy Chambers, Justine DeRitter, Alexandra Furias, and you know what? I just realized that uh, Veronique is not on here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, there's seven of us now who are gonna be helping push forward on uh, activation and community engagement. So if you hear from any of us, it's because we're trying to make sure that uh, we're um, helping this population engage in with each other and with the content. And our 100th meeting is going to be next month. So we're going to be doing a bit of a retrospective on um, you know, where the SSBMG has come from, some of the major maybe uh, reports back from some of the initiatives. Um, there's going to be some really interesting conversation, hopefully, um, and, and this will line us up for our 101 meeting, which will be in October, which will be, you know, hopefully over the summer, the animators will be meeting with some of you and connecting with some of you to find out what's the vision for this group that you're interested in, how can we make it better, how can we make it easier to connect, how can we make it easier to find more information. Now, um, I'm going to let CV introduce herself, but this month's speaker is CV Harkel. She's a toolmaker and idea generator hailing from Chicago, Illinois. And I'm sorry, CV, my introduction got deleted when my okay. thing closed. So if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself and take it away. Um, hi, I'm happy to introduce myself. And as uh, we always do in our feminist enterprise community, I'd also like to start with a territory acknowledgement, partly because I'm coming in from a different country. Um, but my family and I are colonists, unwelcome columnists, col colonists on the traditional territory of the Council of Three Fires. And those are the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi people. Um, they confederated together almost a thousand years ago to share stewardship and use of this land that we currently call Chicago. And I acknowledge my debt to them and to their community uh, in their historic uh, stewardship of this territory, but also in their current use and stewardship of this territory. And as a feminist business person, um, it's very important for me personally, even though I'm an American where a land acknowledgement is uncommon, um, it's important to me to acknowledge my debt and my responsibility in settler colonialism, um, because as a feminist, I'm responsible to address all forms of oppression, um, whether that's capitalism, whether it's sexism, whether it's settler colonialism, um, whether it's um, carnism, all of these things are part of my responsibility as a feminist. And also part of my work as a feminist business person is to push forward ideas and to use my own work as a way to help co-create a world where the politics of domination and um, the, uh, a world where settler colonialism is just not only not normal, but not possible. And so that's my challenge as a feminist business person. Um, some of you may know me through my connection to the Strongly Sustainable Business Model Group through a tool that I developed called the Feminist Business Model Canvas. And it was actually the Feminist Business Model Canvas that brought me into the orbit of this group um, through Anthony's work when he was developing, along with the rest of you all, the um, Strongly Sustainable Business Model Canvas tool. And we originally thought that our connection was around, hey, we're both tool makers trying to use this process of tool making and tool distribution and development and, um, and use 
to bring forward different visions of what business could be. So we thought our connection was around the tool, but we discovered quite delightfully that our connection was actually around a common cause and a common goal of both of the movements that we participate in, which is the concept of flourishing. So um, just as you all focus on a concept of flourishing for all living things and all living systems, so too do feminists. And feminist philosophers and eco-feminists in particular have been promoting the concept of flourishing as the ultimate goal of a feminist approach to the world. And it's kind of interesting that um, despite all the conversation that's gone on in business in the last 10 or 15 years around positive business and um, flourishing for business, very, very little and basically almost none of it has tapped into a very deep and rich conversation in feminism about flourishing. Um, so that is an important thing just to know for um, the rest of our conversation. Is it okay if I um, turn on screen share now? Yes, okay, I'm gonna share my screen and force you to <laughs> force you to look at all my slides, folks. Okay, and let, uh, so basically I had forgotten because um, Lori was so organized that she organized me a long time ago. I had forgotten exactly what the title of my talk was, but I knew that the purpose of this conversation um, was to talk about or to think about what a feminist approach to business and entrepreneurship can offer to the conversation about strongly sustainable business models. Now, Anthony, as just your regular good guy, had suggested that I do a talk to promote my book. And I forgot all about that because I'm really like kind of captivated by this question of how can I, as a proponent of feminist entrepreneurship, how can I help others see what this perspective offers um, so that we can not only have common cause, but also draw on the wisdom from each of our conversations to enrich what the work that we're doing. So my intent in our conversation today is really to talk about what, um, what the conversation that I'm central to can offer to you. And in that way, I may have, uh, I wondered if I appropriately diagnosed it I'm wondering if I may be kind of undershot um, the connection, but we'll see, and that'll be part of our conversation. But what I was hoping to do today was um, first to kind of give you a quick introduction to me, so that's done. And then I wanna talk a little bit about the feminism that I'm using and that we'll be using, because there's so many feminisms out there. Um, I'll talk about what alternatives, what different ways of thinking feminism offers to us, and particularly feminist business, and then I'll talk a little bit about um, how strongly sustainable business models and feminist business orientations are related, where there's some overlap and where there's some distance. And from that, um, I have a couple of suggestions that you all might work with feminist business people to um, promote and enrich what you're up to. And then of course, we have the usual uh, questions and resources. Um, how does that sound? You know, and please happily, please like go. It's only it's just a handful of us um, in the live conversation. So please feel free to hop in and interrupt me because I can I can totally roll with interruptions just as long as Lori gives me like a ten minute warning before it's time to leave. So I find that I often have to start conversations with business people of any stripe with two definitions. Um, the first one is offering a definition of feminism. So the feminism that I use is a, a feminism that brings together ideas from feminist conversations that meet a couple of criteria. The first criterion has to be that they focus on feminism as a collective movement, as something that we do together to benefit all of us, not feminism that's um, narrowly defined as me climbing up the corporate ladder. So it's a collective feminism. And it's also an inclusive feminism because it looks at and draws from all traditions of feminism that are um, designed to help us address different types of simultaneous oppression. So feminists often use the word intersectionality to talk about the overlap of different systems of oppression or different systems of power. 
and um, in a collective and inclusive approach to feminism, we are always talking about not just a gender-based system of domination and constraint, but also systems based um, on all different stories of oppression. So basically feminism as we practice it is a movement that's really designed to end sexism and sexist exploitation and all oppressions. And I find every time I offer this definition, I have to like not only put the asterisk in there, but then go to what that means because people don't believe me. When I say that feminism is about ending sexism, it's about ending racism, it's about ending settler colonialism, it's about ending classism, speciesism, ableism, nativism, capital centrism, all of it. Because I'm sure you've heard that phrase, um, none of us is free till all of us is free. And none of us is free until all of these systems of oppression have been dealt with. Each of those systems of oppression has a specific conversation with specific insights and action steps. And we try to draw from all of them based on the activities or the, um, the purpose that we're pursuing at any given time. So that's what feminism is kind of against. It's against all forms of oppression, but there's also stuff that feminism is for and that feminism is trying to do. And the first of these is to establish political, social and economic equality among all human beings. And when we talk about equality, we're meaning equal worthiness, equal humanity, um, not equal treatment under the law. That's a diminished understanding of equality. We're really talking about this idea that every human being is equally worthy of opportunities to thrive and flourish. And some people um, who are more advanced in their thinking will extend that to other living creatures and other living systems and acknowledge that every living thing, and even if we think about rocks and dirt as living things, um, every living thing is worthy of care. Every living thing is worthy of liberation. Every living thing is worthy of flourishing. And that's the kind of equality that we're moving towards. And then um, the other part of, of the equality is this idea that what our ultimate goal is to create a world in which all people and all living things flourish. So when you understand that as the ultimate goal of feminism, you can see just how nicely connected it is to the strongly sustainable business conversation because your whole or our, I consider myself a legitimate peripheral participant in this group and um, all of us together acknowledge that our goal is to create a world where flourishing is possible for all living things. And so that's the, the absolute easiest nexus between um, feminism and strongly sustainable business. Um, the other definition that I find that I have to offer in most business conversations is a definition of oppression. Oppression is one of those words that if I were ever to have used it in an MBA classroom when I was a professor, um, I would get scathing remarks on my um, faculty evaluations because oppression is just a word that we don't even admit in a conventional conversation around business. And oppression, it's, like, it's a pretty heavy word, but it really, when you look at what it is, it's pretty straightforward. Oppression is the unjust use and allocation of power and privilege. It's a use of power that isn't democratically designated. It's unjust, it's unfair. It goes a little bit further though. Oppression is based in a belief that one group of people is better than all other groups of people or that one sort of living creature is better and more important than all other living things. And therefore that they have a natural, necessary and normal right to have power over others. Um, it's important to note that oppression is systemic. It is institutionalized. It's a system level thing. And that's why it can't be fixed by individual action alone. And so to understand what feminist business is bringing to the party, if you will. Feminist business is bringing a feminist perspective that acknowledges and searches for um, and aims to root out, if you will, this unjust allocation and use of power and privilege. 
So in a nutshell, those are the two definitions that um, folks have to kind of grok before we can take a leap into the rest of our conversation. So let me just take a moment and ask you all if you have any questions either about that definition of feminism or that definition of oppression, um, because uh, both of them are things that we don't commonly see in a business conversation. I think it's important. Uh, I've just been reviewing uh, land acknowledgements, given the fact that some of the atrocities, again, have been uncovered here in Canada, and realizing how much we dilute our language to make it make us feel better. Uh, and so we're not talking about impression. We're not talking about colonialism. We're not talking about violence. And I think this is a really important thing to be talking about right now. And this actually helps me understand uh, how, why it's so important and how this perspective is connected. Yeah, I think, Lori, the other um, word that I don't, I don't use, probably because I got punished too much for using it, is the word exploitation. Um, because that freaks business people out because that's Marxist, right? Oh. And then the other one that um, is much is more common, I think, in a uh, sustain, conventional sustainability conversation is this idea of extractivism. And both of those are um, ways that oppression is used, right? Oppression is used to extract and exploit other people in, uh, or other resources in unjust ways. Okay, so let me talk uh, like, kind of, Anthony, were you going to pop in yeah, with a question? Yeah, I was, I was going to say, um, I'm going to ask, could, could you just do a quick compare and contrast between feminism and modernism? I can't because I don't know what modernism is. Okay, okay, fair enough. <laughs> it, it's, I don't it's, know. Uh, I mean, I mean it, it, for me, I it looks... I can tell you it, what, what it, what, how it compares to humanism, but I can't tell you right. how it compares to modernism. I, it, it, I mean, it seems to me that it, it fits very, that, that, that if I was to write a definition of modernism from a criti critical perspective, it would have many of these same points, if not exactly the same points. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. So I'll just make a note of that and I'll go off and learn about that after our conversation. Maybe, okay. we, would, maybe um, we would have 25 more attendees if we said modernism and not feminism. <laughs> well, yeah, there, there is absolutely a way in which um, using the word feminism uh, it scares people because they don't know what it is and they think who knows what they think um it's part of the vast conspiracy um against uh a systems level consciousness of oppression so but now you'll know and so you can tell people oh we had a feminist conversation and it wasn't scary she totally didn't hate men and you know she might even have shaved her legs i could not tell it was on zoom okay so um, let me shift to, uh, with that background kind of in mind, um, let me shift to talking about what feminism brings to the party. And uh, I think about what feminism brings to the party or what feminist bring, feminism brings to the conversation. I think about it a lot because um, oftentimes, especially lately, I'm told, oh, feminism isn't that important. We've kind of been there and done that. We have equality for women. And I'm like, uh huh. And then I also get told that feminism isn't useful because really what we're working on now is anti black racism or settler colonialism or some other label for a way in to this conversation about oppression and about a future. And so let me talk a little bit about what makes feminism unique and useful. And I would argue, or I do argue, it's not even a uh, subjunctive, um, that feminism offers us alternatives to business as usual in three different areas. And one area is in terms of insights. One area is in terms of purpose, the purpose of business. And then the third part is the practices of business. And so moving from a feminist perspective, we get some, um, some new juice, some new energy, some new insights um, on these three levels. So first is thinking about the insights that feminism offers. So one thing that people may or may not know is that feminism has a very long and broad conversation. Um, you can anchor feminism all the way back to wherever you wanna anchor it, but at the very least, we've had at least 300 years of feminist analyses of the world and feminist conversations about what the future of a better world would look like. And these conversations start 
on the uh, conversation around gender and gender dynamics because feminists look at gendering systems and also sexing systems. So the way we socially construct masculine and feminine, male and uh, man and woman, and the way we biologically socially construct male and female. We look at that interrelated system and we look at the story that it tells and how that story sets up men and males to have power over women and females. We see that as a kind of elaborate lie um, to make some people more equal than others. And we see that that pattern in that story is repeated over and over and over, whether it's about physical abilities, whether it's about cognitive abilities, uh, whether it's about um, your, uh, your native language, all of the stories uh, follow that pattern that the gender story helps us understand. And what's important about a gendering story and a sexing story is that um, none of us can escape it. Um, it is active everywhere we go and it's active in the most intimate of our relationships with each other. Um, and also, there's another reason. Oh, the other reason that it's really uh, challenging and why feminism provides a really rich conversation is that um, sex differences are the last bastion of an argument that one group of people are different from each other and therefore are better. So you would never be able to say that um, African-Americans are different from white Americans because of their basic body structure, their biology. Yeah, there are some, you know, trending this way and that way differences, um, largely cosmetic, largely genetic, meaning inherited from, you know, historic legacies. But, um, but nobody really believes that black people are fundamentally different from white people and therefore should be, um, you know, should be subject to the decisions of white people. But people really do believe that males and females are different and that there's something about males that makes them, you know, in charge. And in fact, it's not only people believe that, but we have a whole lot of religions that are dedicated to making that argument and keeping that argument alive. So uh, feminism as a perspective on anti-oppression um, offers us something different because it is the kind of the last place that we can go to challenge this notion that some people are innately better than others. So um, that was a little bit of a digression, sorry about that. Um, in any case, the other thing that feminism offers in terms of insights is that feminist conversation over the last 300 years has included conversation about all forms of oppression, not just gender oppression. And so you can turn and find a feminist conversation about, uh, about ability or disability. You can turn and find feminist conversation about classism. You can turn around and find feminist conversation about carnism. It's all there because feminists have um, thought about how is this pattern based on gender and biology replicated elsewhere to tell us that some people are better than others and should be in charge. So if you look into feminist conversation, yeah, there's a lot about gender. There's a lot about other stuff. And actually, I'll, let me just wave at my bookshelf because there's, the, you know, there's stuff about all sorts of things up there, even down to um, like how data is misused um, or how systems of software um, and basically developed machine languages are, are gendered. Anyway, all that to say. Then um, the other thing that's really important from an analytic perspective is that feminism has always taken a systems level perspective, understanding that gendering culturally and biologically is a system um, that is beyond just an individual's purview or an individual's um, span or, or circle of control. Uh, the other thing that feminism has also always done is it's invoked all levels of analysis and all levels of relationship. So you can find a feminist analysis of 
the space program. And you can find feminist analyses of um, how we see ourselves, how we interact in intimate relationships, how we interact in work relationships, how we interact in groups. And every level of analysis has a feminist insight, a feminist lens to it. And that is not the case with um, some other anti-oppression conversations. They haven't gotten to that yet. So anyway, that's something that feminism offers, just a whole lot of stuff to help us see the world differently. And um, feminists also, you know, feminist philosophers have um, really attacked uh, conventional Western ontology and epistemology, really challenging what knowledge is and how knowledge itself is gendered and how our understanding of reality is gendered and how that impacts so many other things. So this feminist conversation is big and could be powerful if we dip into it for ideas for the challenges that we're facing in our businesses right now. All right, so lots of insights. I also think that feminism offers a revolutionary purpose. And so it's not just about ending oppression, it's about achieving equality and creating flourishing. This is gonna sound harsh, but you will not find that statement of purpose in many anti-oppression conversations. If you go into a DEI conversation in your average business, they're gonna talk about inclusion and what do they mean? They mean assimilation into the white Western hetero patriarchal capitalist extractivist system. They're not talking about using the values of different groups to actually transform the system. Feminism is. Feminism wants a different system. And so that is something that is very powerful about a feminist approach to oppression as a concept. Um, and that is, um, again, as a white woman, it's really hard to I put myself on the line to say things like, if you talk to um, folks in, uh, involved in the anti-Black racism movement, they may not have developed yet a conversation about what the future ought to be beyond that it ought to be absent of oppression. Now, if you talk to Black Lives Matter folks, they have a much fuller analysis. Why? Because, because they're Black feminists led. Anyway, all that to say, that's again an aside, pardon me, but my general point is that when we take a feminist perspective on what's supposed to happen in this world, we're gonna fix what's broken, we're gonna make sure people are all treated and experience the world as equally worthy. And then we're gonna get our act together and work on creating a future that's better than what we've got. It's three steps. And many conversations are really just about the first step. So far, I mean, they can, you know, feminism has a little bit of a, a head start because it's been around for a long time. Okay. I, I've just, I was just gonna yeah. observe, observe uh, CV that, um, this shift from thinking about um, solving the immediate problem to, to imagining what how good we could be um, is is a shift in thinking that uh, has come in from appreciative inquiry um, or at least that's my and and getting out of this problem solution mindset because it it's the people with power who can define what the problem is. And they can also, it's also the people with power who can de define what an acceptable solution is. Whereas when you appreciate situations and try and improve situations, that's a much more inclusive uh, approach. And it leads people to ask, how good could we be? Which is exactly the point that you're making here. It's, it's that shift, which is um, so necessary because if we can't imagine it, we can't bring it about. Right. And I think that's really important that um, appreciative inquiry and then later, um, the, the positive organizations or you know, the teal conversation, all of that stuff, they have brought a lot of these conversation or a lot of these issues into the conversation about business. And as they've done that, they've left some critical things behind. Namely, you know, females, children, life outside of work. But I'll get there. The other thing that um, feminism offers in terms of a revolutionary purpose 
is that feminism has a relatively shared foundation of values that feminism uses to envision and to craft a sense of the future. And um, we often feel challenged when we start talking about values and what are shared values and common values is that when we start to list them, um, we come up with hundreds of wonderful things that we want to guide us. Um, but uh, in some of my own work, I have put together a, um, a set of feminist values for business that are kind of meta categories that organize how feminists talk about what they would like the world to be. And so in my work, I've proposed looking at feminist writing throughout the years um, and also feminist efforts to build businesses. Um, I've looked at what are the values that feminists propose should organize the way that we work together to get stuff done. And those um, sort out into these five things. The first one is equality and equal worthiness. And that idea of equality drives a whole lot of other related values like things like democracy or um, uh, rich conversations or um, well, I, I won't go too deep into it, but so equality is one meta category. The second is agency and agency is basically the opposite of oppression. Agency is the ability to set your own course to influence the world around you, to enact your own desires and preferences, to be an agent active in the world that's not subjugated. Um, the third category is uh, what I just call whole humanness. And with this category of values, I'm trying to capture this idea that um, feminists, because of women's historic connection to the body, um, feminists talk a lot and think a lot about the cycles of life, um, caring and, uh, you know, people being born and growing and being, you know, powerful in their middle ages and then getting old and dying. So we think about that. Um, feminists think a lot about the heart, the mind, and the soul, not necessarily as separate things, but as all being part of what makes us human, um, the being our full selves, recognizing that we rest and have energy and we're restored, that we eat, sleep, sleep, poop, and menstruate. Shocking. And all of those things about being fully human, not cogs in a machine, not idealized workers, not widgets, but full human beings, that has to be part of what guides us as we create businesses for the future. Because we're humans, we're not machines, we're also not dolphins. So what, what do we have that we need to honor and that we need to consider as we're building these things together to get stuff done. Um, the fourth one is generativity. And generativity is a word I use specifically, not because regenerativity isn't great. Um, I have a lot of colleagues that I totally love who are promoting regenerative economics and regenerative approaches. But I hold on to the word generativity for two reasons. Um, the first reason is that generativity um, focuses on not only returning and recycling and renewing, but also creating a new. So generativity captures things like innovation or creativity or sparks or um, whatever it happens when in evolution we have a, a variation. So generativity captures that idea of creating things new as well as um, regenerate, regenerative processes. And the other reason I hold on to the word generativity is because um, theories of adult development, particularly Eric Erickson, um, theories of adult development understand that to be fully human, we need to have roles in our lives where we care for others. And we need to care about people who are younger than us and older than, than us but we also have to care about the generations to come. And generativity, when we're able to incorporate that into our lives is a way that we feel fully human. 
And the concept of generativity helps incorporate in a feminist conversation, the years and years and years of conversation about an ethic of care and the role of care and the role of nurturing in human flourishing. Generativity is hit critical to human flourishing. Interestingly, just as an aside, Eric Erickson said that generativity was like your second to last stage of adult development and then you die basically. And it was because he looked at all of, um, he studied men and had he studied women, he would have noticed that women start to worry about generativity the, you know, at least around the time that they start menstruating, but certainly around the time that they start thinking about becoming, in most cases, women becoming mothers. Um, because, and that happens way early in a female human being's life than, you know, at age 65, as Erickson was expecting. Just, that's another thing that feminism brings to the party. This understanding that generativity can be part of our lives from the get-go from, you know, as we are growing um, from childhood into adulthood. We don't have to wait till we're 65 to be generative. And then the final one is a value that I, I literally had to make up a word for because in English, we don't have one. And the word I have is interindependence. And this is the concept or the value that recognizes that um, to be, uh, you know, to flourish as human beings and to flourish as a planet, we have to do two things simultaneously. One is that we have to develop and grow and be strong. I didn't get that. Whoops, Good. Siri is mad at me. We have to develop and be strong individually, but also we have to contribute to and draw from a community. So to flourish, we have to be interdependent and independent at the same time, hence interindependence. And so the idea there is that this sort of macro value pulls in all the other values around connecting and relating and networking and um, relying on each other and collaborating and all that sort of good stuff that is really antithetical to how we think about success in Western business, right? So it's the, all of that stuff that um, is the opposite of... Um, tournament models and competing and fighting to the finish and dominating your competition and stuff like that. So in feminist business, we loosely use these five labels to talk about the kinds of things that really matter to building a business that will ultimately provide for what we need to help us flourish and help the world flourish. So we need equality, we need agency, we need to embrace our whole humanness and each other's whole humanness. We need to have room for and value generativity. And we also have to always operate interindependently. So that's the feminist values um, for business kind of in a nutshell. So then, then there's one last thing that feminism offers us as an alternative to our idea of business as usual. And um, this is actually something that uh, is an issue when I talk with social entrepreneurs. So one of the things that feminism offers and feminist business offers is this notion that the entire organization and its network and its ecosystem, your whole business, all of its stakeholders are sites and tools for transformation. So one of the things that I've always loved about the, um, the flourishing business canvas is the way that it invites people to kind of send thought tentacles out into the rest of the organization and uh, beyond the revenue model and into the rest of the organization's the business's ecosystem to think about what can this agent, the, what can this business do? with these different connections, with these different sites, with these different tools to engage them in the flourishing perspective, in the goal of flourishing. And feminist business very definitely says, the way that we organize as a business is a primary powerful invitation to do things differently. Um, and one of the things that I felt so sad about, honestly, when I've looked at- Sorry, I'm holding my watch and it keeps talking back to me. Um, one of the things I felt so sad about in the last 15 years, 20 years of conversation about social entrepreneurship is how 
by and large, social entrepreneurship says, let's run a business in the regular way. We'll generate money or products or whatever to fix other people over there. So they continue to create harm to generate resources to fix harm somewhere else without ever really looking at the harm that they're causing each other and the earth in the way that they're generating stuff. So that's always seemed like a big opportunity for me. Then the other thing that, um, that feminist business and feminists in general try to do is um, to experiment with what we're up to and how we're trying to do stuff. And that's because we just know the way that we do many things ultimately hurts us, but we don't know what we don't know how to fix everything perfectly at the same time. So it's very much an experimental, some would say a lean uh, approach to business practice. I like to call it discovery driven because I have a history that I didn't mention of teaching lean entrepreneurship. Um, but, I, but when we talk about feminist business practices, we're like, what can we do here with what we've got given that we have this goal, given that we have these values, how can we demonstrate them in the moment? And how can we be creative about how we do this stuff? And that ends up um, being really fun when you think about uh, how do we create relationships with uh, suppliers? Or how do we create uh, our product? Like what's the design process that we go through that helps us build at the very same time and experience um, in, a, in a proactive way the vision that we have for the future? And I can't remember that there is a really um, fun word that I can't remember that is uh, that basically means we're doing now what we hope to be in the future. And it begins with a P, but I can't remember it. So anyway, so all this to say these three sets of things, um, these insights, this purpose, and this experimental and pretty comprehensive set of business practices kind of all get brought into the notion of a feminist business. And I realized I should do this slide upside down. So let me say, let's look at the bottom part first, the smaller letters. Letters. A feminist business makes thoughtful products, maintains life-sustaining revenues, and returns fair and just values to all stakeholders, right? And that can include the um, environment. And it basically operates as a business, but it does other stuff too. It enacts feminist values, it promotes justice and it operates in ways that are generative politically, socially, and economically. It operates in ways that try to uh, counter conventional extraction by putting out into the rest of the world new experimental ways of doing stuff. So um, a feminist business intentionally tries to influence all of the other businesses and entities that it touches because it's trying to operate in ways that trigger and generate and innovate and spark flourishing or movement toward flourishing in other places. So when it's all said and done, that's what a feminist business tries to do. So um, when we think about what does feminist business and a socially sustainable business model group have in common? Where is there, where do these things fit together? The number one thing is that both of these approaches, both of these conversations is focused on this goal of flourishing for all living things. And you know, as well as I do, how revolutionary and how transformative and how rare that is as a goal for a business. It's so rare, it's so revolutionary that people, you know, poo poo it and think it's ridiculous and say, really, you mean positive organizing? Really, you mean social entrepreneurship? And you know, no, that's not what we mean. We mean that everything we do here is a step towards this inchoate, maybe this vague, maybe understanding that the ultimate goal is flourishing for every living thing. And that is why, you know, we have this shared revolutionary intent, I guess, is important. Also, one of the things that's really true about the strongly sustainable conversation is that this conversation is about systems change. It's not about one business getting good enough so that it can dominate others. It's not about one industry being able to take over the economy and direct all other industries like finance does right now in the US. 
but it's about changing all of these systems and acknowledging that as we change these big systems, we have to change the intermediate ones and we also have to change at a personal level. We have to incorporate um, the same challenge in our personal participation at work, in our personal participation in relationships with each other as leaders, as managers, as consultants. It's all part and parcel of the work that we're doing because that's how we change systems. And then um, the strongly sustainable conversation is a conversation that says the entity is a tool for change. Every piece of this entity, every decision in this entity is a tool for change. We might not transform every one of it at the same time, but we know that every, every procedure, every routine, every norm, every KPI is an opportunity to do things differently, to move forward on this revolutionary path. And both feminist business as an approach and socially strongly sustainable business models as that approach, they, they share these things. And that's, I think why, um, here, here's like, to be perfectly honest, that's why when I met Anthony and Andine and started to hear them talk about what they were up to, instead of feeling competition, I felt relief. I felt appreciation. I felt a little bit of joy. I felt like I had company because the goals are so, they're so aligned. And I'm just coming from a different conversation, but you know, we're, we're singing in the same choir in a way that I think is wonderful. Oops. Um, so that's where I think the two conversations really have some important overlap. But let me talk about where I think they diverge or I fear that they diverge, which then again, turns into an opportunity for us. Um, feminist business requires that we talk about power and that we talk about oppression. And that is not necessarily a conversation that comes naturally to, for example, your average social entrepreneur or to people that are focused on appreciative inquiry or appreciative inquiry or um, donut economics or um, you know, you know, positive organization science. Many of those conversations do what um, in social justice communities we call spiritual bypassing. They jump right over the pain, they jump right over the work and they talk about where we wanna go without addressing oppression and power and sorting that out. And then um, feminist business has a set of conversations and a set of values that coheres the group. So we, we all kind of know vaguely kind of what we're working on and it's coordinated. And I suspect that there is that in the strongly sustainable conversation now in a way that it probably um, was, more, was more vague uh, at the start or like you know five or six years ago. But that sense of having a shared conversation and a shared set of values and a lexicon um, it gives a lot of, uh, is really helpful to feminist business. And I wonder how, uh, how well that is evolved in the strongly sustainable conversation or the flourishing business conversation. And these, are, these two differences are important for um, two fundamental reasons. The first one is that we can't build sustainable businesses on or with rotten power relationships. We can't build a business that doesn't extract from the environment while we are depending on relationships that extract from each other. And so, uh, you know, I, I have a lot of close colleagues in the, um, in the positive organizations conversation and I hate telling them this that, you know, really nice to talk about compassion in an organization and empathy. Why are people in pain? Do you think it has anything to do with the way that your organization is run that puts people in pain that you now have to be compassionate around their pain? 
you can't build a strongly sustainable flourishing world on rotten foundations. And foundations are rotten when they are built on oppression, when they are built on the absence of consent, when they are built on the absence of agency, when they are built in denial of whole humanness. But fundamentally, if they're built on anything around oppression and bad power, if you will, it's going to be rotten. So the big challenge is how do we talk about out how do we talk about oppression and ferret it out and design it out? And also simultaneously, how do we talk about power in a way that um, takes power seriously as a an invitation to work together differently? That that doesn't see power as only a tool of control and domination, but sees it as a tool of agency. So how do we start that conversation? around the right use of power, um, good uses of power, constructive uses of power, consent-based, care-oriented uses of power. So that's the big thing that, that's a, an issue is that if you don't address power relationships and power, um, you're building on a rotten foundation. And then the second one, and I think this is sort of less relevant at this point is that we can't build sustainable businesses without clear and shared values that are around flourishing and that are around equality and that are around um, uh, systems perspective. So if I were to say, oh, okay, so big takeaway, what's the big thing that a socially sustainable business conversation might do differently or might take up as an invitation from you know, some feminist person coming and talking about business. And the number one thing would be to look at organization design and look at organization goals and practices as opportunities to address oppressive power dynamics. So I know that actually in the um, flourishing business canvas process, the way that conversation is understood, the way that deliberation and exploration are understood they are um, they are implicitly about challenging oppressive power dynamics. Explicitly, I don't know, but I do know that for many people, the experience of participating in that design process is an invitation to kind of step into relating with each other differently and in less oppressive interactions. So I would say that that's the the one big thing to be asking. And then the other one would be to, um, and again, this is one I think maybe you've already done, is to use a deliberate and shared set of values to, um, I don't know why the alliteration came out here, but to conjure comprehensive future visions. So when we have a shared set of values that we're using for the comprehensive vision, we can say, at the same time, we want to incorporate and embrace whole humanness in our relationships in this workplace and our relationships with other stakeholders. But we also want to incorporate whole humanness in all the other parts of our lives. We want it to extend out into the rest of our lives. So it's a comprehensive approach to how we think about flourishing business. So when it's all said and done, that's where I came up with. And then I realized, oh, I should probably give you some resources on how to start looking at oppressive power dynamics. And I forgot to do that. So <laughs> I, can still, I can still do that because we have a couple of, of those that we are trying to use. Um, but then I also want to just say, and I know Lori will have this, you know, you have this, pres and I have a couple of extra slides too, but there are some resources that um, are available for thinking about this conversation about feminist business. And obviously one is me. Um, and I have lots of stuff on my website that you can download and read if you want to learn more. And, oh, I also have a book. I forgot. I have a book. I have a book I should tell you to read. Um, and then uh, we also have a feminist business model canvas that is our, our um, the thing that we lead with to have conversations about feminist business. So we have that tool. Um, and then over on lizbeth.com, Petra facilitates 
um, this marvelous conversation about feminist change making. And then we have a feminist enterprise commons, which is a community that Anthony is part of, where we actually try to um, share resources and uh, problem solve together to think about what next with feminist business. And then I have a bunch of people who are really great examples of um, feminist business leadership out in the world, largely Canadian. I don't know why. Well, we do know why, but whatever. So yeah, largely Canadian. Um, and then I have a couple other slides in here that are probably irrelevant, um, but that is the ultimate resource for you. So anyway, so I, I have, oh yeah, it's 4.30. Okay, well, 5.30. Oh my um, gosh, are we out of time? Did I just no, no, like six, use our six, whole time? Six, six o'clock is when we finish. Okay, because I was telling Lori that I this happens to me every time. It's like I sort of get into, it's like if I have too many slides, it's over. Okay. Right? Not At not least I have the right number of slides. Okay, so in any case, Andrew and um, Michael and Amy, and also Lori and Anthony. So, so what do you think? How, um, what do you think about this idea of talking about oppression in the strongly sustainable business conversation? What, what you've reminded me of CV um, is a topic that I've not spent very much time on in the last three or four years, which is actually talking what a, about what a flourishing business actually is. Mm -hmm. um, and in the design process, we've often talked about having um, flourishing business design principles, mm -hmm. um, which are very much um, al aligned with your the values uh, that you've you've put forward for feminist business. Um, and as a result, what are some of the design principles that you've? kind of got in well so, so so part of the challenge here is that we haven't had a ch this is an area that we've not done enough work in so I'm, I'm identifying a gap in our own body body of work here for the flourishing enterprise innovation toolkit specifically so what we've done so far is we've used the future fit business benchmark um, right. which has both an environmental and a social component and the social component um, I know the underlying framework for that and it's it's very aligned with the the values that you've mm. described, um, at least as a, as a certain level. I'm not having done the detailed analysis, but it certainly feels aligned or directionally heading in the same direction. Uh, we also use things like the cooperative principles. Uh, yeah. We also use the um, uh, what are the other uh, the, the the B Corp's um, B Impact Assessment we use to some extent. Um, there's another one that we use that I'm is, is but I, I'm I, I'd like to add your five to to that list because I think that they're they're also good. So as a result of, of not having so part of the reason we haven't been thinking about the design principles is because we haven't been in very many situations where it's been relevant. It's been not relevant. It's always relevant. It, it's we haven't been in situations where it's been possible to have these conversations. The conversations have been much more um, practical. Anthony, I, the, this mm. is, I'm just gonna interrupt you and yeah, say, please, please. this is where you and I are so alike. It's like, uh, I had stopped actually even thinking about the feminist business model canvas because I made that thing like six years ago. And yet every time I use it in a group, they're like, and I'm like, no, I want to go do that. I like, right, you know, right. we've, we all know this stuff and we kind of want to go to the next and the next. And we see mm -hmm. all these pieces Absolutely. that are, that still need to be there. And yet the bulk of the world fi like finds this, the basic, it's like the main, the main entry is like so provocative to people. Right. The, it's, the, hard to, it's, it's hard. Yeah. You have to meet, you have to meet people where they are. Yeah. So just to these two, two points specifically, I want to just observe and then I want to hear some other people uh, give their reactions here as well. Um, so the Flourishing Business Canvas does have a box on it called governance. And that box comes directly from the idea of power. And it's, it's asking people to think about who has the power to make what decisions about what topics. Mm -hmm. So we, it's definitely there. However, because we haven't been having the design principles discussion, we, we haven't been having 
the sorts of discussions that would lead to highly innovative um, governance conversations. Although it's very interesting that the number of people who gravitate towards cooperative structures uh, when they've been using the Flourishing Business Canvas for a while is kind of, I, I, I don't have data on it, it's just a, a vague sense. The second one, the, the, the process part of the second one, in fact, the process part of both one, both are encouraged by the flourishing um, startup method um, in, a, in a very explicit way, but we haven't been talking about the values uh, side of it. So it, again, the, the, the depth to which we've been going in this area, I, I would say is, is nowhere near deep enough for, for what we really sh should be doing, need to be doing. Final comment is knowing the work of the macro strongly sustainable world, so the macro ecological economists, um, there is, knowing its history, I would say it, it didn't come out of this same space at all, and therefore doesn't share those, didn't share those values originally. But I think increasingly it does. Um, so I agree with you, donor economics, for example, doesn't really talk about this stuff very much at all. But yet implicitly, in the idea of a social foundation, there is the idea of equity. Um, so it's, and, and similarly in terms of the planetary, the, the, the ceilings, uh, the ecological ceilings, uh, there is this idea that um, we, um, there, there has to be some equality in the way that we treat the planet as well. Anyway, en enough, enough from me, maybe some other people have some, some comments too. Hopefully they do. And thank you for this comment. This, this is fantastic. Thank you, CB. I'll stop the screen share so we can just all yeah. see each other. Sorry about that. Well, I think what, one of the things to consider about not talking about oppression, it's not typical in our conversations, is the level of risk involved in talking about oppression. Um, you know, uh, I'm in some business practices where we're building and embedding these things in, but there's still some risks to me and people having these conversations because of the, the power imbalance that's not even perceived or recognized by those people that are um, exerting or expressing that power. So um, how do we have these conversations when we have generations of people who uh, have never felt that they can participate in these conversations? That's a, a great question. And I think that, um, that we feel this uh, sort of culturally right now, it's very clear that as cultures, and I'll put um, all of Turtle Island in one sort of large culture, uh, we have lost the skills to have these sorts of conversations. Um, we have lost the skills to have, you know, we all, we all know the training programs on um, courageous conversations and inclusive conversations and, you know, that kind of stuff. And, and we need more of that because we absolutely don't have the skill set. And if I were to, if nobody's asked me recently, but if someone said, you know, so what are the three things that you can do organizationally um, to begin to address issues of governance and decision making and consensus building? And I, like the first thing I would do is have everyone work together on a couple of courses on courageous communication and conversation. And then, um, you know, go through the book, Conflict is Not Abuse. Um, because we just know, we just don't have the skills for it. And we talk about, you know, one of the horrible things in feminist history, it's not horrible, it's disappointing, is that um, so many feminist businesses uh, wanted to be consensus driven, they wanted to be collective, they wanted to have no hierarchy, but the folks involved in them didn't have the skills, first of all, to solve very basic interpersonal interaction problems, and also to suss out the distinctions between um, when we need to have horizontal interaction and when we need to have people with legitimate power over others. Um, and uh, so the second thing that I would do is have lots of conversation around what power is and what power could be. Um, but I think it's really hard. I've had that, uh, you know, I forget now because I'm out of academia now, um, but I forget 
how hard it was to put ideas out there, both as a scholar and also as a teacher in an MBA classroom. Um, especially as, as, as a, a woman who was obviously younger then, but it is not easy to bring up this stuff because at um, the very least, people just swat it away and make fun of you uh, because it gets, you know, it gets at such important questions and important changes that we need to make. Yeah. What was the third thing you were going to suggest, CV? You talked about know. courageous com communication, power, and what that is. And what's the third one? Well, the, you know, Amy, I'm one of those people who I just like say there are three things and I invent oh, okay. them as I'm going. <laughs> but I think that the other thing that I would, um, that I would want uh, people to talk about is um, the notion of, uh, I don't even know how to describe it, but it would be about consent and retreat. That it would be about boundaries. So we would be able to say, um, yes, I, I, full, I, I give my consent to this or I'm not ready to consent to this. And I'm also, this is all I can take. Um, and I bring that up because there's a book that I, I remember when it came out like six years ago um, I can't remember the name of the title, but it was about, uh, and I can find it on my shelf eventually, but it was about deliberately, deliberate learning organizations. And it was about this model of organization where everyone was in there and they were going to deliberately learn. And you would come up with your learning plan and you'd talk about it with your manager and you were going to be a learning organization. And it was going to be deliberate. And all I could think of when I read the book was how the standard of how, what had to be learned and how you had to be learning all the time was oppressive. And I love learning, but sometimes you need to be able to rest. And sometimes, you know what? Sometimes you don't have to learn stuff. And I, I have this experience, Amy, from way back in my, um, my managerial babyhood. I worked at a manufacturing plant and I was a first level manager and we were putting in this high commitment work system, which was team-based, quality-oriented, blah, 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 all that stuff that you did in the late 80s. And I had um, technicians, blue collar workers who were completely unwilling to participate. And I kept thinking that if I could only just explain to them how they could have authority and they could you know, have independence and all that kind of stuff. And they were like, not interested. And finally, one of them explained to me that really they just came to work. They wanted to do a good job, have a pleasant time, get paid and go like hang out on their fishing boats. And I was gobsmacked because I thought everyone wanted to get better. I thought everyone wanted to learn. I thought everyone wanted more authority. And I was like, you know, and what I saw in this book was a complete um, disregard for our different levels of appetite at different times in our life. And there have been times that I've had so much appetite for learning and change and conflict and growth. And then other times it's like, oh, please God, let me just go sit on the sidelines at this meeting. So I would say that that third thing would be somewhere around um, responding to and articulating and caring for each other's place in the world at these moments in time so that we could um, interact more lovingly with each other. So, thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'd like, that's a real, I don't know where that came from, but thank you for asking that question. Because I think that, that these sorts of things, um, one of the things I know is that when I talk to, and I talk with like-minded vis business visionaries, like um, we don't always have the words for these. I don't have the book that would be that third point, but I say those things and like people nod because they've had that experience too. They know that place, um, they see that tension. And so uh, that's always very encouraging because it's like, I'm not crazy. Right. It's just that literally we haven't gotten there yet. We're still in a place where we're trying to let, we're trying to figure out how to get people a living wage. 
So how can we even be talking about um, understanding consent and boundaries and energy and ebbs and flows, right? We, we still have to get people living wages. Um, yeah, well, I think it's an interesting compliment to the idea of oppression because it's not always oppressors, but systems can be, you know, oppressive and we're not machines where we leverage technology, we develop technology, but we follow natural cycles too and we need to ebb and flow and yeah. respect that in ourselves and seek it out and encourage it and enable that in others. Um, so I think that's a really important observation around oppressive systems in general. So uh, I appreciate and that. Moving us from consumers. From whole humanness, just thinking about whole yeah. humanness. And I'm realizing that um, the sun is finally penetrating my basement window. <laughs> I'm like now and like the sunlight. So I'll kind of move a little. I don't know if that helps. Michael. Anyway. Michael? <laughs> yeah. Isn't that silly? Oh my God, there's a sun that moves <laughs> and influences my world. Usually only after 4.30 though. The rest of the time it's just kind of indirect. Go ahead, Michael. There we go. Yeah, yeah, super interesting conversation. And I recognize a lot of this from all kinds of philosophies and models. I, I typed down a list of all the ones we yeah, usually I refer to. Yeah, in the chat. Yeah, yeah. So we, I'm but, really intrigued by this. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm trying to be part of as many groups and conversations as possible around this subject metamodernity, game B, uh, learning society and everything. So, and I know Anthony, you have met uh, Fyodor uh, who hosts evolutionary leadership that also tries to collect some of this. And uh, I think the book is by Michelle Holiday who was in the same program as you were, Anthony. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, and she, she's been a presenter here as well. So, so yeah. uh, to, to your third point, uh, CV, uh, Michelle Holiday's book is kind of interesting, I think. Well, I, you, you mean, I, I know Michelle, like we're friends from way back. Mm. And we're, we're like, we're, we're, we're very clear that we're, um, you know, we're in different conversations with the same efforts. I don't know how to describe it, but I, I, I love Michelle and I always chuckle at what she's up to because it's like, I just don't, I just don't, I'm too much of an academic. Uh, I've had too much of nature beaten out of me, honestly, in as an academic, um, to uh, kind of roll in the the eco thrivability permaculture conversation. It's 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 as foreign to me as the one that's in the other direction of feminism, which is about tarot cards and goddesses. It's like I'm sure there's value there, but I don't track it. And and that's a conversation I'm just not fluent in, but I know that it's that we're together in it. Michael, did you have a uh, uh, another point? Yeah, I like uh, like you said that there's a, there's uh, I, I, I just found it. There's a post by Daniel Gertz who who was one of the people who tried to define meta modernism and said if you're allergic to any of these words like feminist and stuff like that, you you are not you don't have this uh, meta modern mindset and like. I can, I can guess that many people are allergic to the world feminism when you bring up this name of the model and stuff like that, and right. then they're not there. So I just found a link for the post I'll share it there as well. So. And it's funny too that um, when people are allergic to or put off by the word feminism, it just proves the point of why feminism needs to exist. Yeah. Well, it's like the sign behind you, it's for everyone. And I think people <laughs> automatically think that you're taking an anti and the idea is that we're actually really bringing in people. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Like, like all worlds, if you're like the capitalist, postmodernist, profit, religion, all these worlds, and many, many Justin, more. Wait, where does Justin Bieber come in here? And it's from his post. So I just copy pasted from uh, Daniel Gerst's post. But he makes okay. the point if, if you're allergic to any kind of ism or word or think they're the enemy or, uh, or think of the black and white perspective of things like this uh, you have to like step up in that adult development uh, and that actually uh, like uh, truly like meditate and navigate what these words really mean and, and that all models are wrong but some are just useful so Andrew did you have anything you wanted to 
Um, just thinking, um, totally agree with your point about um, oppression, that word, along with other words like um, systemic racism makes people very uncomfortable and particularly men and particularly white people um, because they're the ones holding the power and have benefited it from those structures, right? So, um, and right now, sadly in Canada, we've had two very tragic uh, pieces of news in the last week, the, uh, the, the mass grave in, um, or sorry, unmarked graves yeah. of the children in um, the residential school and the, uh, the terrorist attack on the Muslim family um, just the other day. And so we're really trying to <laughs> confront the racist history of Canada and it makes people really, really uncomfortable. And everybody, you know, it's like people feeling are feeling they're gonna get judged. Mm -hmm. I don't want, you know, I'm not a racist. No, nobody wants to be called a racist, right? Or a, or, you know, a sexist or a homophobe or Islamophobe. Nobody likes those labels, so obviously not. So I guess the question is, how do we, what are your tips to having those those difficult conversations with people who hold power? I know that's a really <laughs> incredibly hard question. And, so. and you've got 30 seconds to answer. <laughs> no, 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 no. I like how we, the timing of this is fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I know, I'm sorry. Well, there, there are two, um, there are two places I go kind of with that question and these are just steps. I, rem I remember the word is prefigurative action. We want to prefigure mm. the future, right? So there are two um, places I go. One is this conversation about natural, normal, and necessary. And uh, that language comes from uh, the veganism and vegan movement um, about thinking about uh, the justifications that we use for how things are there it's natural it's normal or it's necessary or sometimes all three and any time that we can kind of debunk those three ends if you will um, it's a way to kind of un unspool the story or the lie um, so um, you know is it really natural that men and women behave differently in a business is it really normal for, you know, you know, is it really necessary? Like, and sometimes like, for example, necessary, um, sometimes gender differences are in treatment are really necessary because it lets us point out that our organizations aren't designed to fit both sexes. So is it really necessary that women have like a distorted career path? No, it's only because we built the organization's career path that way. So sometimes I, I find playing around with those three categories or those three questions is useful. The other thing that I've been trying to work on, but I haven't made myself sit down yet and do it, is um, trying to find other language for talking about what feminism is. So it took me a really long time actually to um, authorize myself to offer a definition of feminism that went beyond the one that is most common, which has been proffered by Bell Hooks, who's a black feminist theorist, and she focuses on sexism and oppressions. And to add those other pieces was like a mind blower to me. And it was really hard because I'd never thought I had the authority to define what feminism is and to define collective and inclusive feminism. And surprise, it's really useful once you do that. And I've spent so much time like on that part that I haven't figured out how to say, well, you know, feminism really is about looking at systems of power and relationship that are destructive. And I haven't found ways to talk about it in a paragraph that would let me take the word feminism out, but that would do that in a way that didn't, um, that didn't neuter it, right? So um, in conversations about race, um, there, we don't use this word anymore, but there's this word called deracination. And it is the, the disillusion, the dissolving of the notion of race in, in a, or the trace of a race in a person or whatever. But in any case, I think a lot about um, how the power of feminism and feminist insights 
has been neutered because the political charge of them has been taken away and then people have just used the fun parts. And that's one of my biggest uh, complaints about um, like, you know, the caring organization conversation. Well, you can't have that conversation unless you understand who is expected to do the caring and who's not acknowledged for the caring and who, you know, blah, all that sort of stuff. So I, I wonder about how do we um, step past the category labels, you know, so how would we talk about what metamodernism is in a way that never used the word metamodern? Um, how would we talk about what that viewpoint allows us to see? So sometimes I think um, if I talked more about feminist values, so if I said, well, really what we're trying to do here is embrace interindependence, you know, or but so that's just one of the places that I've been going. So thinking about natural, normal, necessary, debunking those, and then trying to find a richer way to talk about feminism that put more stuff, that almost padded the word so it didn't feel so barbed. There, I find nothing wrong about the word feminism. And in fact, I have a whole riff on why we need to use the word, which I won't subject you to here because it's 13 slides. Um, but uh, I also think that we need to give it more context. I've spent so much time talking about what it isn't. I wanna spend more time talking about what it is. Well, one year from now, when we have you back, we'll, we've, uh, Amy and I have made a note and Anthony's made a note. We're gonna hold you to having some of the answers for us, or maybe we'll have some answers for you. <laughs> I appreciate you coming uh, CV and with this important presentation. If there's no other questions or comments, we'll wrap up the session. I, I will be posting this uh, recording um, onto the YouTube channel and into the Google, uh, Google Drive. Um, anybody, if you haven't um, made a copy of yourself for the chat and you want to uh, save some of those things, down at the bottom where you type in the chat, there's a little file name and there's a little three dots from there. You can go ahead and save the chat for yourself. That way you'll have it handy. Um, we'll uh, put the chat in the Google Drive as well, but sometimes you want to look at these things uh, right after the meeting while they're fresh in your mind. So without further ado, I will end the meeting. Thank you for coming. I appreciate uh, everyone's Thank participation. Thank you. Talk to you later. Talk to you soon. Ciao. Okay. Take care. Bye. Bye. Good night, everyone. CV, will you be able to share your PowerPoint? I don't, I'm not sure. Oh yes, know. absolutely. Okay. So I, um, I did send them to you, right? I am actually not.